accolades and accomplishments of, of his life. Let's just say eminent. Is eminent that good? You like eminent, Don? Eminent. How about old? <laughs> well, most, most eminent people are old because it takes a while to get to eminent, you know. So, But uh, he is, um, like myself, a transplant. But he is a transplant to Kansas from Connecticut. So, yeah. How many have you been to Connecticut? It's real. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, beautiful place, but um, he has been at Wichita State for some time. Done some incredible work all over the state. And I think, Don, um, I said you were going to, on the program, we were talking about it, so Noah, you just talk about whatever you want. But please make welcome Dr. Don Blake. Thank you. Well, I know I'm speaking to an audience of mostly people from the High Plains, so uh, you'll understand some of this. The very first Europeans who got to the High Plains, does anyone other than the guy I talked to last night know what their first reaction was? Pure panic. Okay, it was Coronado's army came out under the southern high plains in 1541. And the first day on the high plains, one of the soldiers rode off and never found his way back to a 2,000 man army. And what's more, uh, they had two natives with, actually three native guides with them, two of them certainly from the plains and b both Wichita's, and a third man who, well, if you read the documents, they said, well, he was also from Quivira, but I finally tracked down his name. He was a young man, his na name was Chave, and it's not a Wichita name, it's not a Pawnee name, it's not, as well, the Spaniards were calling the other two by nicknames that they came up with. So El Turco was the Turk because of his, uh, apparently his headdress that looked like a Turkish one. And Isopete, which is Aesop, the fable teller. But it turns out Chave is a Nahuatl name, an Aztec name. And there was a place I've not been able to track down where yet in Mexico that was named Chave. And since he spoke Nahuatl language, he may have been from Mexico rather than on the High Plains. But these guys, okay, so they lost one man and their two guides were arguing about which way they ought to go and they were just sure they were lost. And so The native people who were here had similar problems. How do you get from one place to another? And if, regardless of whether you're trading or on the warpath or, as I will tell you about, uh, seeking a religious experience. So here's, uh, I've worked on native trails since, good Lord, I know, I guess the early 80s when a student of mine discovered that where he was doing some field work in the Flint Hills, that there was a major north-south trail there. And he came back and talked to me and we started working out, well, things to do. And then I worked at Wilson Lake and the very first visit there, we were talking, I'd hired him to be the crew chief. And we wondered, well, maybe, was there a trail that came through here? And the answer was, well, yeah, it's called the Pawnee Trail. Uh, and so here is a set of trails, not all of them that I have, have documented. And you guys are going to be interested in this one, right? If you can figure out where that went. Uh, it's got an interesting and long history. So here's a colorized version of a map 
produced from the Lewis and Clark expedition. So this is data as of uh, 1806. And you have this trail, okay, from the Platte below the forks on down, crossing the Arkansas. And those of you who deal with the Santa Fe Trail will realize, okay, here's the mountain branch of the Santa Fe Trail. So this is a little misleading. They, so Lewis and Clark, of course, were never out in this area, right? So this is something they learned from people along the Missouri River and put together. And so Ringing Water River here is uh, Plum Creek. Uh, natives called it by a different name. But all they knew was that this trail that came from below the forks of the Platte ran across a stream of some sort before getting to the Arkansas. Here's my version of it. So Fort McPherson below the forks of the Platte, there was a trail that ran down Medicine Creek to the Republican and then came around this way to Fort Wallace and, and then eventually to Sand Creek and on to Ben Snoo Fort. And here's the mountain route here. So right through this area, there was a trail that was in existence before Lewis and Clark so that they could record it. And various people encountered various versions of it thereafter. One of many native trails. And here's another map. This is also uh, early 1800s. This is a map that Zebulon Pike got from two French fur traders while he was still in St. Louis. And this is, again, uh, his handwriting was awful. I mean, really, really, really awful to the point that he had written a native name on the, his, his field maps, uh, Iatan, this word here which is a Wichita name for the Comanche. But when he got back and started writing up an account, he, he read it as Tetaws. So uh, those of you who have bad handwriting shouldn't feel bad. But, so these guys, the Cardinal brothers, Polite and Jean-Marie, had been to Santa Fe. And they recorded a route from up here on this, this is the Platte, going past the Salt Marsh, that's where Lincoln, Nebraska is, on down to the Solomon, where named for a fur trader who had a post on the Solomon, and then on to the Smoky Hill, and then they've got two branches, one labeled short crossing and one long crossing. And notice this little snake-like figure. This is... Uh, the Salt Marsh by Great Bend, and also this rocky cave in which 500 men might sleep. I went, well, there's no such thing. And I figured out, well, that must be Pawnee Rock. That's the only rocky place. And I gave a talk out in Dodge one, one year. And somebody stood up afterwards and says, well, I know about that cave because my grandfather slept in that cave. Two men, uh, Big Schultz and Little Schultz, were herding cattle for the railroad. And a blizzard came on and the big old bull, red bulls, they said, went into this cave and laid down and just went to sleep for the duration. And so they snuggled up against the bull to keep warm and survived the blizzard. So before quarrying, there was a big rock slab that had fallen off of uh, Pawnee Rock. And that's, that's this uh, landmark. And then here's the trail, of course, along, you know, one of the ver native trails ran on both sides of the Arkansas. Uh, and then you have this trail going from there to Santa Fe 
And this is the Cimarron cutoff in 1806, long before uh, the supposed invention of the Santa Fe Trail. So all of the later routes, all of, most of the major routes were native trails first. And so here's, here's putting it on a ma modern map from the Oto village up uh, by the Platte, past the Pawnee village, and on down to the Cimarron Cutoff. So, why do you need trails on the high plains? Well, if you're going hunting, or if you're trading, or warfare. Also, at least in some areas, major trails mark the boundaries of tribal lands. Uh, really well-documented cases, northeastern Nebraska, where the Omaha, there was a land claims case in 1912 where there were a whole bunch of witnesses describing the limits of their bison hunting territory, and every single person described them in terms of a series of trails that went from where their village was in northeastern Nebraska, south to the Platte, along the north part of the side of the Platte, to the Loop, and then north again to the Niobrara and back home. So that's one of a number that marked boundaries. And then people made pilgrimages to places like this, uh, sacred places of a variety of sorts. So you need trails, but how do you find your way? Okay. First of all, <laughs> The some of the movements after beginning at 1300 AD, we have archaeological records of people traveling in large groups, village sized groups, hundreds of miles to go hunting bison. There were villages of what we call Oneota people, these would be Siouan speakers in northeast, north, pardon me, northwestern Iowa who walked to north central Kansas to go hunting bison, taking men, women, and children hundreds of miles on foot, which produces a whole series of needs. Okay, so there, one way to say it is there, there um, of these native trails, there were the equivalents of superhighways and also the equivalents of Highway 40, okay, both. If you're taking hundreds of people long distance with men, women, and children and carrying some property on the backs of dogs, a dog can do 10 miles a day. I bet you didn't know that, that we have, we have a, what was our puppy that now weighs 95 pounds, uh, who is very eager for walks and can drag us off our feet at a moment's notice. But they only can do that for short distances. Okay? They're built close to the ground, they can overheat pretty readily, and they tire out on a long route. So 10 miles a day, hundreds of people who have to be fed. How do you do that? And the answer is, are you really well organized and really well planned? We have accounts from southern Kansas. There was a trail called the Black Dog Trail that ran along the southern border. If you start at Baxter Springs in southeasternmost Kansas, it sort of wobbled between Kansas and Oklahoma until it got over near the Arkansas River, and then it ran up north, crossed near Oxford, and went up between the Chukaskia and Niniska on that divide on out to the bison hunting country. with gardens along that route, native gardens. So you people would go out in the spring and plant crops that would be available for eating for the fall hunt. 
You would have scouts going out and checking the condition of the grassland. Where will the bison be? So loads of organization and planning for those long expeditions with all sorts of requirements for that trail that you might follow. So what do you want? Number one, you want water. It's heavy, it's hard to carry in large quantities, and if you're going to do 10 miles a day, well, you want water every evening. In this part of the world, that puts strict conditions on where a trail might run. At major, whoops, pardon me, I went too fast there, hit the wrong button. At the major rivers, you want a ford. So you can cross. So that initial trail that the student of mine found way back in the early 80s ran along the crest of the Flint Hills. And it's, it's amazing. You can get on the Flint Hills in northern Oklahoma and walk to the Niobrara River in Nebraska. And in Kansas, you have to cross only two streams. And where that resistant rock has been cut through by a stream, there's a rocky ford. So the rocky ford uh, near Paxico, if you know where that is, you go west from, uh, from Topeka, it's, I don't know, a few exits. And there was a major crossing there. That's what became the crossing for uh, the Oregon Trail. So you cross the South Cottonwood, you cross the Kansas River, and then you cross the Platte, and that would be it, all the way across two states. But what you also need are landmarks. And this is where it gets interesting. This is what the Spaniards didn't understand about their guide, El Turco, was that he knew where he was going. And you get on the high plains, and how many landmarks are there? And their answer is more than you might expect, more than you thought there were. I was working down in the Panhand just below the panhandle of Texas on the, working on the Coronado expedition and met a rancher there, Pete Odom, and went out to his ranch, and he was talking about landmarks. And I said, really, which ones? And he said, well, how about Harpole Hill? And I said, I've never heard of it. And he said, well, it's, it's a high point. He said, come, come, on, come to the back door. We walked to the back door of his house, and he said, he said, there. And he pointed at the horizon like this, and I'm looking, I don't see a thing. And so I took my camera, and I used the zoom lens and scanned the horizon. And sure enough, there was a little bump. And I said, okay, yeah, I, I can see it now. And he said, okay, that's 29 feet higher than the average elevation around here. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he said, "There's everybody who came through, they camped, they, they, they went over the top of that hill. The next day we went to look at some features on his ranch, and we went across the interstate and on an overpass. And he said, stop in the middle of the overpass. Okay, So that's like this area. You can do that without, without causing a traffic jam. And uh, he said, get out and look around. And I did. And then he said, how, how far do you think you can see? And I said, I don't know, 15, 20 miles? He said, yeah, you're 29 feet above the average elevation right here. That's the high plains. Right? So People had a really good eye for picking out the highest points of land, and trails ran not only to them, but right over the top of them. And then, of course, you want food and shelter. Food, those, those rocky fords are an excellent food source. When the water is forced to go through a shallower portion, because of rock below, 
the water flows faster and it sucks the sediment out from upstream and you get a permanent or more permanent than anywhere else water hole and there will be fish and there will be freshwater mussels and the animals, the grazing animals will learn that there's always water there so the game trails lead to that point and the, the game will show up. So uh, the, the trails sometimes had their own uh, food sources. Also, groves of trees. So some of you I'm sure have heard of uh, the big timbers on the, well, in Colorado, it's the Arkansas, right? And by the way, we're right and they're wrong. Okay, It's the, the Gia Sioux name for their original group that included the Osage and Kansas and others was Alkansa. And so that's, that's the source of the word. And so we're closer the, to it than Bill Clinton and others. <laughs> you also want shelter. And uh, I did survey at Wilson Lake and found, yeah, there were nice little rock shelters where would make, you know, in bad weather, a really good camping spot. And we noticed that right outside the major rock shelters, there were, oh, choke cherries and other food sources that weren't anywhere else. Okay. If you eat choke cherries, what do you do with the pits? You spit them out, and by golly, you get, you get food growing there the next time you come through. But you also want to avoid some things. You don't want to, if you're on foot and your dogs are carrying your property, how many streams do you want to cross? As few as possible. And also all of the brush that's along the streams and in the valleys, you want to avoid that. And you don't want to deal with too many steep hills, which are usually by streams. And so the major trails tended to run along the divides between major streams, the backbones of the country. Now you have to have a really good eye to pick them out if you're up on them. Uh, Richard Irving Dodge wrote about that in one of his books on the plains, and other people did too. You'd be on one of those and you'd have to have somebody with a really good eye which, of course, a native guide would have, to picking out this winding path that will not only avoid all of the steep hills and avoid most of the stream crossings, but take you past the headwater springs of the tributary streams. So there's water regularly, and the best water. Right? Uh, I ran across, working down in Texas, an account of uh, Sam Houston got involved in a lawsuit in some little Texas town and lost. And apparently he came storming out of the courthouse and the local intrepid news reporter said, oh, well, President Houston, uh, do you ever plan to come back to our fine town? And Houston said, I'd rather drink river water than ever come back to this place. <laughs> so the best the purest water where you don't have to worry about what was going on upstream is at the springs. Okay, here's a map that shows a couple of landmarks. This was drawn by an Oto in 1825, and it's showing the path of a war party. They came on out all the way into Colorado, from that, that same Oto village on the other map. And it shows, uh, it shows the Rocky Mountains as just this wiggly line. But then it has down here the, the shaded in two points. And up here it has this baby with something up above it. And it's two buttes, Colorado, southwestern Colorado. Now, if if you enjoy open country, and I think most of you must, <laughs> this is a great place to visit. Uh, I, when my sons were little, 
We camped there one weekend. It used to be a state park, and the state gave up taking care of it. And we were there. We got in on a Saturday, and there was one other family in the whole place, and they left. And so Sunday, we were the only people there. Uh, it's really remote, but those buttes are visible for a very long distance, and they were uh, guides. So the Ulibari expedition from Santa Fe up into eastern Colorado and western Kansas, they went by two buttes. And then up here, this is Pikes Peak. And that blob that he drew, that's the Garden of the Gods. That was a, well, this is all one sacred area. You have Pikes Peak, you have Cave of the Winds, Manitou Springs, Garden of the Gods, and this trail, the Ute Pass Trail, coming down. That's the scene of the Pawnee creation story. That's where Morning Star and Evening Star got together to produce the first Pawnee woman. So landmarks, big ones, okay, so you can see Pikes Peak for a huge distance and much, much subtler ones. So here's another one. It's a bit subtler. So this, this is, here's Fort Dodge. Here's Mulberry Creek. Here is a north-south trail. This is the route that Coronado took coming north from Texas. And here is Mount Jesus. It's, a, it's not a huge hill, but that's what they named it. And the trail went, is shown here, going right over the top of it. And in fact, if you go there, there's a dirt road that still goes right over the top. It's, so this trail is, at least that little portion of it, still in use. Okay, along trails you find a whole variety of man-made features. Uh, some of them are no longer visible, so shelters... Uh, on the trail, the Pawnee sometimes use teepees, and sometimes they use essentially a wigwam-like structure, like the Caw did, and they would leave those poles in place. The bent-over poles that you could drape either mats or hides over and ha have a shelter. Uh, there was a, a German who came along what became before the Oregon Trail was the Oregon Trail, he came, was traveling along it, and he came to, to a junction with one of the Pawnee Trails and said, there are all these wigwam structures here. There, there's nobody here, but the shelters are in place. Well, of course, all of those are gone, but there were trail markers, piles of stone. At Wilson Lake, we found a series of them. They were all knocked down by later people looking for some sort of treasure that wasn't there. But when we explored, okay, at Wilson Lake, there are a whole bunch of uh, box canyons. Hell Canyon, Hell Creek Canyon is one of them. It's right adjacent to the dam. Somebody named it because they got in there <laughs> hunting one winter and couldn't find their way out except back the way they came. And so that's, that's Hell Creek Others, there were a few of them that would take you back up to the uplands, to the continuation of the North-South Trail, the Pawnee Trail there. And each of those was marked by a stone cairn. So when you were down in the bottoms and there were all sorts of possibilities about how to get back up, you knew which one to take. So think of those blue signs or those, you know, interstate this way. The Pawnee Trail was definitely an interstate. Along that Flint Hills Trail, not on the trail itself, but off at the ends of side ridges, there were occasional stone cairns that you could not see from the bottoms. So they weren't guides to on the trail, but my student, after talking, he went and investigated, well, what do you find if you leave the trail, go down when you see a cairn, and go down, and the answer was 
stone quarries for making tools, springs, good campsites. So those blue signs along the interstate, you know, food, gas, lodging, this exit, they had the equivalent. Of course, in this area, you might not have any stone. Okay? And there was an early Spanish expedition that eventually got to Ladder Creek, but they were lost for a while until their guide finally noticed some cairns made out of sod that were put up on top of the ridges to mark the route. There were some out by Sun City that were mentioned. And then shrines, uh, we'll talk a bit about those, and rock art, frequently along the trails, but especially at special places. So, let's turn to people who use the trails. Traders, this is what I'm working on right now. Uh, the ancestors of the Wichita who were here in Kansas from oh, 1400 up uh, into 1700 or so when they began to move south, were trading with people all across the country. And I mean that literally. Okay, So there were early Spanish expedition that got to the Colorado River. The people there had rawhide, bison rawhide shields for warfare. And they were able to communicate with a man, uh, I think it was the lower Gila River, who told them about the Great Plains and all the bison. He knew where those things were coming from. One, there were also shields well down on the west coast of Mexico, made out of bison rawhide. So west coast on the east coast, DeSoto's man ran into, visited a temple in an abandoned town in South Carolina, and there was a room full of war gear, raw, raw high, bison rawhide shields, helmets, and body armor. Again, our image of natives usually doesn't include armor, but all of the Plains groups had it, and all of the people in the Southwest. So the Zuni had, guess what? Bison rawhide shields, helmets, and body armor when the Spaniards first got there. So this is from Rice County, a couple of potsherds from the Pueblo area. We find those. Turquoise in McPherson County, and also at, at Sanoa. In fact, at, at, so this is just a little lump. Okay, So four centimeters, that's a pretty big lump. At Etsanoa, uh, the State Historical Society did a project there in the 1990s. They got 128 of these, okay? huge quantities larger quantities than further west. Obsidian, okay. these again are from McPherson County, but McPherson County, Rice County, at Sanoa, all of the uh, towns of Quivira had some obsidian coming mostly from the Hemas Mountains in New Mexico, but some pieces, yeah, this is what really blew me away, it, we're trained in the sciences to be really suspicious of odd information and to reject it. So 25 years ago, I think, uh, we got a donation of a collection from McPherson County, and there were two little blades of obsidian from central Mexico. And I went, okay, these guys must have had a family vacation down there. They brought back some souvenirs. I just ignored it. And then somebody gave me, passed hand to hand from an, another archaeologist, three cores of the same obsidian from central Mexico. 
And she wanted to know if they were from the Coronado expedition. And I said, oh, no, 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 no way. They were, they were, they'd used up all of their uh, obsidian by the time they got to Kansas. And it turned out, well, we're up to 10 pieces of this obsidian, which is more than the whole rest of the United States. The people of Quivira were in contact with the Aztec capital down in central Mexico. And also, by the way, they spoke, some of them spoke Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs. So very long distance trade and old. Okay, so let's go back in time. This is one of the more famous artifacts ever found in the United States. It's from the V. Hopewell site in Ohio. Uh, dated uh, around 200 A.D. And this headdress has antlers, as you can see. These, those are wooden antlers that were covered with copper foil. But this head plate is of iron. Yeah, well, the natives did not smelt iron ore. This is meteoric iron. And the guy now dead, uh, who was the, the foremost, as they, they call themselves, okay, they have a little problem. They call themselves meteoriticists because meteorologist was t already taken. Okay? <laughs> but they study the trace elements and the chemical composition of meteorites to understand the early history of the solar system. And that John Wasson, the guy's name, analyzed a few of the pieces of meteoric iron from the Hopewell sites in Ohio and was able to determine that they came from Kansas. Okay. They came from this meteorite, okay. the Brenham meteorite. Uh, how many of you have visited the world's largest hand-dug well? Okay, yeah, yeah, you, there's not much else to do in Greensburg, so you stop and look at the well, right? And Palisite meteorite. Okay. They have one big chunk of what's properly the Brenham meteorite. Brenham is uh, used to be a town. Uh, just east along the railroad tracks. Near there is the fall spot of the Brenham meteorite, and it's a very rare, first of all, this, it's called a stony iron. Uh, that's a rare form. This is a palisite, which is a rare form of stony iron. And among palisites, this one is really strange because these crystals here are rounded and the chemical composition, the trace elements in the iron is very, very specific. And so this was the source of multiple examples of meteoric iron in the eastern United States. People traveling from Ohio to Kansas to get this stuff. And by the way, the, well, I'll, I'll come to that. Now. So. I gave a talk years ago about trails and sacred, well, actually sacred sites in Greensburg, and there was this couple in the back of the room, way back there, who were, I could see they were kind of bouncing up and down in their seats and looking at one another and looking at me, and they, they came up afterwards, you know, talking to various people, and they were the last, and they said, uh, you have to stay overnight. We're going to take you someplace, okay? And they took me to a sacred site. So... The Pawnee, uh, we have more information on some of their beliefs, um, including what I think you're going to hear about tonight, because of a Pawnee named James Murray who got educated and then spent his life gathering as much as he could of the traditions of his people, the Skeedy Pawnee. And that included information about specific sacred sites where people could go and get knowledge from the spirits of the animals that live in the underworld. And they, the sort of the Anglo 
name for that was the animal lodges. Well, Condor Spring was one of them. Okay? And it turned out they, there are a number of features. Again, the same student, by the way, after he graduated, went on and worked for the Bureau of Reclamation in Grand Island, right in the center of Pawnee country, and went out and revisited the places where a bunch of those animal lodges were, and put together, there was a, a recipe. There were a number of things they had. First of all, a stream or a spring of water. Well, of course, you have to get there, right? So I, everyone has a trail. And there's either a vertical rock cliff or a vertical bluff, a lodge-shaped feature that looks like a Pawnee Earth Lodge, a high hill, something that could be conceived of as an entrance to the underworld, a cave or a spring, and a profusion of life, rich vegetation and animal life. Okay, so those people took me to this place. Okay, this is the High Plains. Right? You, can, you can tell that from the top here, right? <laughs> that looks like High Plains country. But this grove of trees in the middle of nowhere, right? a few miles from where that meteorite landed. And this picture is a little fuzzy, but here's the entrance to the underworld, and there's a spring emerging from the base of this cliff. That's my younger son when he was about 12, I think went out there with me. And here's some of the rock art, okay. including uh, this is a kind of feature that's called a rib stone. And most of the rib stones are up in northern plains in Canada, but all the way to Ohio. And there are shrines where you can address the bison spirit to have success in hunting. And the, the most important one was up in Canada, it's called the Iron Creek Meteorite, a meteorite on top of a high hill, put there by the natives. Okay? There are a whole bunch of meteorites found on top of high hills in the Great Plains because people actually carried them to those spots. So this is a depiction of the ribs of the bison, uh, but there's also this, right? So how do you draw a picture of a falling star? There it is, right? And this same rock art has some human figures, like this guy, with hands upraised in blessing or worship. It was used both ways. In fact, that was a friendly greeting to strangers. If you wanted to show that you were friendly, you, you put your hands up, and then you put one of them on your heart. Or actually, that's not their, their version. That's our version. You put it on your esophagus. Okay? That's the center of the soul for the Pawnee. So here, there are a whole bunch of these human figures, and what's really interesting is this little guy has one in his hand, and this little guy, has a, they have stars in their hand. They're documenting that they found a piece of a fallen star. So this is the sacred site next to the Brenham meteorite. And here's the Black Dog Trail. Oh, this would be the Black Dog Trail, this portion. And it goes straight over to Brenham, right? And it's recorded uh, in an early history of Missouri as, as going along the southern border and then curving up to the mouth of the Ohio River, and here's the Hopewell site. If you go west from Brenham, you're on the Santa Fe Trail. And then you, if you go to the native headwaters of the river, not our headwaters, right, through Canyon City. Uh, their headwaters was Fountain Creek. Okay? The Spaniards called this the Napestle, which is an Apache word meaning bubbling up all around. 
referring to the Manitou Springs up there by Garden of the Gods. And what do you find at the Garden of the Gods? Bighorn sheep. This is a tobacco pipe from a Hopewell site in Ohio. And it's an image of a bighorn sheep. How many bighorn sheep lived in Ohio? None. <laughs> Missouri, none. Kansas, none. Rocky Mountains, yes. So this is a fantastic animal from the edge of the world. And if you think that's impressive, and I think it's impressive, here's a ceramic effigy of a bighorn sheep horn from, as you can see, a Hopewell site in Florida. So 2,000 years ago, people in Florida knew about those places because of pilgrimages that people took to places, to distant places. And here is back to the Hopewell site. The whole complex is named for it because of the fantastic finds there that included in two adjacent mounds. In one mound, there were at least 500 of these fabulous, oversized, then we call them ceremonial blades, in, under one mound. Under the adjacent mound was all of the flakes and debris left from making these things buried next to a person. Apparently the guy who was responsible for going from Ohio to, okay, with obsidian, you can figure out, you can determine where it's from. Most of the obsidian at that site is from Yellowstone Park. And the rest is from Idaho. So somebody 2,000 years ago walked to what's now Yellowstone Park to Obsidian Cliff and taking a whole bunch of people with him and brought back over 300 pounds of obsidian to make into these ceremonial objects that were used in a ritual and then buried. What do you need to be able to do that? Oh, this is before people were using dogs. Okay, so we have no, certainly people in Ohio, there's no record of them ever using dogs for pack animals. So people pack animals. But what you really need, first thing you need is you have to know it's there. There's no reason to go that far with a, enough equipment and people to bring this stuff back. So people in Ohio knew about Yellowstone Park. Everybody on the continent knew about Yellowstone Park. Okay? They also knew ab about Pikes Peak, Garden of the Gods. Those were major, major shrines. Up at the Canadian border, there's another one, uh, a major mountain that everybody seems to have known about. So even deep back in time, but extending all the way across the high plains, people knew about distant, distant places and went there for religious reasons. And so I'm going to start, stop talking and see if you guys have any questions. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. It was, we, we've decided in Kansas archaeology to name the kinds of chippable stone for the geologic formations. So you have Smoky Hill Jasper. Yeah. So, so it goes for probably a mile. Our pasture, nearest pasture to the north. And we've got the highest hill. Uh, not elevation wise, but location wise. And you can see it from a long ways away. You can 20 miles, 20 miles, 20 miles, but you can't see far north because there's hills, uh -huh. highland hills. So our family stayed in about the same place since 1871. And the people that owned the pasture to the north of us, they've had it since 1872. And so 
along this trail that we talk about was this big, huge rock. And the early uh. pioneers would come along and they would chip off pieces of this big rock. There's no other rocks around. It's big like that and there's no other rocks that are colored like that. It's a brown, kind of a, has a shine iridescence to it. So they got real sick and tired of people coming along and chipping pieces off of their rocks. So they loaded on to something back in the 20s or 10s and they hauled it down to their farmstead. It's still there. And I looked at it when I was a kid, because they're my relatives, and I thought, dang, that looks like a meteorite. And so it could be, but how yeah. many Indians have got it up there? Would they have taken poles and wedged it up there? Really good question. Uh, I can't answer that particular one, but I really want to see it. <laughs> we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to talk about that because I've done. I have an article that's in press right now, uh, for in an archaeological journal on meteorite shrines. Most of these relatives no longer shoot at you when you come around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if you arrange it as a relative, that might work. I, you guys are laughing. I, I once was talking to a person in uh, New Mexico. I wanted to try to track Coronado's route across the Galisteo Basin, and people I was talking to, they all looked at one another and went, and they said, well, you can do part of it, but there's this woman who owns a big chunk of it. She's her ranch, and we're pretty sure she actually killed somebody. It was a guy found shot to death on on her property who wasn't supposed to be there. So, so that's that's real, at least in some areas. But I I would love to see that. I can give you an example. Okay, there's uh, there was a meteorite uh, on. The Red, well, near the Red River, right by Wichita Falls, Texas, that natives took from Santa Ana Mountain, if you know where that is, uh, 150 miles, maybe, maybe 190 miles away. They had, the Comanches had it. It was a sacred object. It was, they had put it in a cave, and Santa Ana Mountain is really sandy stuff, and their cave collapsed. And so they dug it out and they took it to this sacred hill in Wichita Falls, or, or where Wichita Falls is today. Uh, but they had horses, and so they, they dragged it behind horses. And they said that even so, they didn't want to kill their horses, so they did it over a period of time. So. Yeah, they, people would work hard to get those things where they belonged. And, uh, yes? In all the evidence of the incredibly extensive trade, were there peddlers? Were there peddlers? Yes, there were. Uh, and so the people who led, who guided Coronado's expedition, were definitely long distance traders. And El Turco, the, the Spaniards eventually concluded wrongly that he, he was lying to them and he was plotting with the people of Pecos to, to kill them by taking them out where their horses would die and they would starve to death and die of thirst. Okay. But he took them out onto the high plains of Texas in the rainy season at the peak of the earth, in that area, they hunted bison twice a year, and one, one of the times was in the springtime when the gra grass greens up early down there. And so the, all the playa lakes were full. There were thunderstorms. So at the peak of the rainy season, they're going to die of thirst, uh, not likely, and die of hunger. Oh, they, were, they were never out of sight of the bison herds. They recorded that specifically. No Plains Indian would think they were going to die. Right? So he was telling the truth. So, so repeat your question again. About the peddlers. Okay, okay. Well, he was a peddler. He said 
that he guided a man from, actually two men from Pecos Pueblo, across the Mississippi River, and that they came back with a, a metal bracelet, some other jewelry, an earthenware pot, and a dog. Very, very specific info. Okay. Now, the Spaniards were confused. Right? One of the Spaniards' soldiers showed El Turco something made of gold and you know, asked him if he knew what it was. And they you know, couldn't communicate well. And he, and he named it. He said, and they recorded it as Acochis. Well, that's a Wichita word, and it means metal. But they went, oh, he knows what gold is. And they asked him, well, where can we find some of that? And he's describing this place, and he's describing the lower Mississippi River Valley. And, yeah, if he took, uh, the two people he took were essentially the peace chief and war chief of Pecos Pueblo. And he took them to the Missis what we call the Mississippian country. And they came back with exactly the sort of gifts that a important people would get. So a copper bracelet some other jewelry, probably marine shell, and there is East Coast marine shell or Florida marine shell at Pecos that was dug up. And an earthenware pot, they made some fancy vessels for ceremonial drinks, so probably one of their ceramic bottles, and they raised little dogs that did not bark as food. And so this list of items makes perfect sense. And he actually described to the Spaniards copper mining in the Appalachians in exactly the same terms that a peddler that DeSoto ran across in Florida described. So yeah, there were some long distance peddlers, we don't know how many, but most of the exchanges were actually gifts. Uh, they didn't have our kind of economy. No evidence of any use of anything for money. But you, you visited people and you brought gifts with you and they gave you gifts in return. And it, it's one way of making sure that when times get hard where you are, okay, so think about this place, right? Times do get hard in a bad year or a string of bad years. You really can't live there for a while. What do you do? You go to visit some of your friends and you bring the usual kind of gifts. So people tra gave gifts and, of moccasins and got moccasins in return, uh, par fleshes, that is raw rawhide packages for rawhide packages, food for food. And then when you were in need, you could still give stuff to your hosts and they would keep you for a while sometimes for a long while. There's an account up in Canada of people living in the northern forest, actually, and there was a major volcanic eruption that covered the area with volcanic ash for years. And so people had to leave, completely leave, those who survived. And they, the account, the traditions say they went way east and they stayed for a generation, and then when things began greening up, they went home again. Their descendants went home. So that was everybody's insurance policy. And so it was something that was important to do. And you wanted friends in every direction at various distances. And so that's who you visited on a regular basis. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, there are medicine wheels and medicine wheels. And today we have kind of fake shamans who, uh, you know, who, who create their own medicine wheels. Uh, medicine wheels go back in Canada where we have some have, there's some excavations we've done. We can see the, the, the spear points 
and the, at the bottom of some of those are thousands of years old. And they were sacred spots. And, but there were some of them that were memorials to in, individuals and others that were more general sacred places. There were quite a variety. Uh, so the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in the Bighorn Mountains, I got to visit that a long time ago. There's a fence around it now. There wasn't back then. Was it's spectacular, uh, and it has orientations to certain stars in the sky, to the points where those stars rise above the horizon, and there are four of those. And at that particular elevation, at that particular latitude, those stars rise one lunar month apart. And you can just see, okay, they, they, <laughs> they went, they picked that place because they already knew it, it had this relationship to the sky and to time that they wanted. So uh, lots of variation within that within the, the set of stuff. Yes? You talked about Wakanda Springs, um, the Lake Bear, and the Sacred um, Lodge. Where was that located? Was it south of the, the lake? No, it's under the lake, unfortunately. Uh, it, it was a, a very unusual feature for the Great Plains. It was a spring that came right out of the top of a hill because the spring created the hill. It was a travertine deposit, uh, minerals from, from the water, uh, which had a bit of salt in it as well as these other minerals. And so the local people, the homesteaders who moved into the area, thought it was directly connected to the ocean, which it wasn't. But the... The spring pool was 100 feet in diameter, okay? And so here, here's, here's a, your entrance to the underworld, your connection to the underworld. Uh, they, in the late 19th century, there was a sanitarium there, essentially. And they hired a deep sea diver to go down and bring up some of the, and he brought up some of the stuff that natives had offered there. And so Wakanda is uh, actually a Kanza word uh, for the great mystery, for the God, if you will. But they, they, their concept is quite different than that. But the sacred. So it was a sacred place. It had all of the features that we're talking about. Oh, uh, the, 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 the city, and it was a, a beaver uh, effigy or uh, well, it's not not a beaver. I don't know where that one came from. Uh, one of my students figured it out. We were the ones that found that. How, how many of has anyone been to the serpent figure near lions? I got. <laughs> My wife, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's it's spectacular. It's uh, what about 120 feet long, carved into the hillside, is this figure of a snake with open jaws and something in its mouth. And I had been there, and luckily because we were surveying at Wakanda Lake and walking across this hillside and. I walked through this depression and out the other side and then um, went on I'm uh, maybe 100 feet or so before my conscience got the better of me. And we had a volunteer with us, Cleta Mulder, who was a member of the, uh, the KAA, the Archaeological Society uh, for the state. And I called her over and I said, come with me. And we went back up and we stood in that depression and I said, do you see anything? And she said, well, we're in a depression. I said, you ever been to the serpent lions? And you have to know Cleta. She looked around and she went, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 and, 
And it turned out it was a remnant of another figure. And they, uh, a farm road had just obliterated most of the body, but the, head, the open mouth was there. And we went back some years later and mapped it in very, very carefully and did some magnetometry on it and then went to the serpent by lions and were doing the same stuff. And my, the student who was in charge of taking the measurements and drawing the, the results said, oh, I know what that thing by Wakanda Lake is. And I said, really? You don't need you. She said, well, come here. And she had the, the t pictures of the two and you went, yeah, that's the same open mouth. This is no doubt. It, it was a serpent. Uh, the, there's a part of the Pawnee creation story that was shared by other groups was that Morningstar from the east, that Morningstar is male, had to go through a whole bunch of adventures and things to beat before he could mate with Evening Star in the west at the Garden of Evening Star at Pike's Peak. And one of the things that happened to him was he was swallowed by a giant snake in the sky. Constellation of Scorpio. It's very snake-like. And uh, again, a former student of mine had a computer program for the sky, and he got in, he was asked to look specifically at 1300 AD. And he did, and found that on the spring equinox, coming up, that year in Kansas, the sun rose in full eclipse. And in, visible in the eastern sky was Venus and Mars and Jupiter and Mercury, all clustered right near the sun that would be visible because the sun was in full eclipse. And that's the start of this Pawnee story of the gods in the sky convening and deciding what needed to be done. And then now, okay, here's, here's a technical term. I can't avoid it. Retrograde motion. Any, how many of you can go, yeah, I know what that means. Uh, you, uh, you got one, okay? There's probably another one in there. At any rate, because Mars is fairly close to the Earth, it's really obvious that once a year when the Earth, which is in a smaller orbit and is spinning, rotating around the sun faster, will pass Mars. And Mars will be going one direction, and then it's like when you look out the side window of your car. It goes backwards for a while and then goes forwards again. The apparent motion. Well, in 1300, Mars went into retrograde motion. And guess which constellation? Yeah. And the story says that he fought his way out, and then... The translations differ because the Pawnees use the same word for flint, arrowhead, and meteor. But this thing in the mouth of the serpent is probably a fireball, a meteorite coming to Earth. So. Well, actually, the figures of the serpents were carved by Wichita's. And there's another one in Kansas. I have not been able to get to. It's on private property. But it's along another trail that ran from Rice County down to essentially the yeah. southeastern corner of the state. Uh, it became, part of it became the California Trail. And... On, along that trail is a big rock called Courthouse Rock. And a local person told me, oh, there's this figure of a snake, just like the one you're talking about with something in its mouth, on Courthouse Rock. So they were marking their, their territory with these things.
Okay, let's have one more question before we uh, let Don go for a little while. Anybody else? One more? Mary, you got one more? Well, I probably got a lot, but yeah, I'll have you there. Mary, <laughs> <laughs> you do. Is Jamie back there? I'm right here. Oh, she's <laughs> Sneaky, isn't she? <laughs> so, uh, Don, I would like to introduce you, your friend. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Nancy Arendt to come and present you with our Fort Wallace uh, 2023 coin. And she's going to. Uh, oh, we thank go. you. Yes, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. And if any of you is interested in the KIA, this is the per a person to talk to, not the person, but certainly a person to help you with that. She's, uh, got, she's going to make an announcement about that. Okay, which is, excellent. Yes. But Good time. Before that, uh, I would also like to tell, tell you and honor you, you are part of the D.K. Clark Lecture Series here at the Fort Wallace Museum, uh, uh, named after a special person, a friend of, to all of us, to, as, you, as you as well. So I'd like to ask D.K. to present you with our lecture coin. Oh, the, uh, the face of the coin you can see on front of the podium, but on the back... Uh, it says, uh, for those who inspire, inform, and preserve Kansas heritage. And you have done that more than just this, but this time. And so it's very precious, and I'd like to present you with coin Thank number you. 13. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Don. You're welcome. You want to make just a brief announcement about the KAA? Yes, but before I do that, I want to take a moment of remembrance of Lim Marsh. He was very significant in uh, recording history and historic research. He loved history. He was always here at these events. He passed away in January. He was the guy behind the camera, and he is the one that took this picture that this emblem of the DK Lecture Series was modeled after. So um, we want to take a moment of remembrance for him um, and his research. His research is being gifted to me, and I will make sure that it gets in the right repositories. Um, Don, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned the KAA, the Kansas Anthropological Association, is an organization of avocational and professional people from not only Kansas but from all over. That um, are, It's people that's interested in history and prehistory. We have a dig every year, and this year the dig's going to be in Scott County at the Scott edge, south edge of Scott Lake. It's going to be on a Native American site. The date of the um, supposed occupants were around 16 to 1700s, the Dismal River Aspect people, and they were the um, ancestors of the Apache. We will be digging there from June the 2nd to the 18th, there's information on the uh, board over in the lobby about it and our organization. We invite you to join us for a day or the whole time. You can come and go or just a visit. We'll have full excavations going. We'll have a full operating lab at the fairgrounds at Scott City. Uh, we'll have evening programs. It's all inclusive. It's a wonderful event. It's very, very affordable. And you can visit with me if you have questions or get information from that board up front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, well, yeah, we, we're going to do five minutes, and, and then after that, I'm sending Deb, okay, and she's going to come, and she's going to come find you. So a uh, five-minute break, and then let's come back and be ready for Ken Spurgeon's presentation. That was fantastic, wasn't it? It was excellent. That's all right. That's all right. We got...